of the 24th annual Fever Winter Series on Aging. And I am your host, I'm Elena Volpi. And uh, this uh, lecture series honors the memory of uh, Dr. Edward Lefebvre. Um, Dr. Lefebvre uh, started geriatric medicine on this island, essentially. Um, and he started it in 1939. He taught internal medicine here at UTMB, and then later became the director of uh, Turner's and Moody's House, which is now the Meridian uh, Retirement Community. And before he died, uh, UTMB developed the geriatric, the geriatric division, which has been thriving ever since. So today it is a real pleasure for me to uh, introduce Dr. Jeff Williamson. Um, he is the uh, Chief of Gerontology and Geriatric Medicine, the Director of the Kulinich Center for Memory and Cognition Research, the Clinical Director of the Stick Center on Aging, and the Director of the Center for Healthcare Innovation at Wake Forest University in Winston-Salem. Dr. Williams received his bachelor's degree from Emory University, um, the medical degree from the Medical College of Georgia, and a master's degree in, uh, uh, from the Johns Hopkins University. And then he completed his residency training in internal medicine at the University of Maryland VA in Baltimore and the fellowship training in geriatrics at Hopkins. Um, where he also uh, did another fellowship in cardiovascular epidemiology at the NHLBI Department of Epidemiology. Um, he started his academic career at Hopkins and uh, then moved to Wake Forest uh, University as an assistant professor and has been there ever since, climbing up all the way to the positions he's holding right now. So Dr. Williamson's research uh, focuses finding novel ways to improve the health and cognition of older adults through the conduct of large clinical trials. He's one of those big clinical trialists we have in this country. He's been the principal investigator or clinical site principal in investigator of many trials uh, funded by the NIH, uh, both uh, cardiovascular kind of trials and uh, geriatric trials. Among those are the Accord, Accord Bone, the Alzheimer's Neuroimaging Initiative, the GEMS, the Alzheimer's Disease Cooperative Study, the Accordium Mind, the SPRINT trial, and the new Dementia Care trial, which we're also collaborating. So we're uh, now collaborators on that. Um, he is uh, one of the leaders of the Wake Forest Pepper Center and has published more than 190 papers in high-impact journals and served in the editorial boards of several scientific journals um, and also uh, study sections. He um, is now serving also on important national committees charged with writing the guidelines for management of patients with hypertension. Um, he has received many honors and awards, among which he, has, uh, um, he was selected as the Hartford Foundation Young Faculty Award in Geriatric Medicine and has received, the, uh, for many years, the Best Doctors in America Award. Uh, Dr. Williamson has also been a mentor to a number of successful students, fellows, and junior faculty. And I'm really happy today to introduce him um, to speak for our Lefebvre Winter Series on Aging. The title is Integrating Physical and Cognitive Function Outcomes into Large Clinical Trials, the SPRINT Example. Jeff. Ellen, I just read, usually my mom is the only one who reads that. So anyway, thank you very much for that very nice introduction. Um, I try to get additional salary every time I get a new title, but it doesn't work that way. So um, <laughs> anyway, it's a great honor to be here uh, for this lecture series. I uh, really was thinking about just the, the foresight of uh, Dr. Lefebvre and his family for thinking 24 years ago about this lecture series. It's uh, very few people were thinking about geriatrics tw 24 years ago. And uh, even the size of this room and audience means that uh, we've uh, come a long way, and I think uh, that foresight is being rewarded uh, handsomely. And so it, it's, uh, it's a great privilege and honor for me to be here. It's also a privilege to be invited by Elena, who uh, I've already told her this, but you know, my, the brains behind the operation at Wake Forest is my friend Steve Krzyzewski. He'll come to the forefront here in some of the things I'll say. But Steve, has, every time he comes back from here, he says, I really like her a lot. 
And Steve never says that about anyone. So if, if he says it about somebody, that means it's really true. Uh, so uh, and then so just uh, thanks for that. It's good to see other friends, uh, Dr. Goodwin, etc. And I've had a, I've had a wonderful day just getting to know some of the faculty here. And I haven't been to Galveston uh, since I was ten years old, so it's changed a lot. And it's really been uh, it's been a, a nice trip. And I sent my wife uh, back a message and said we need to come visit here again. So um, so we'll do that. Uh, it's cooler in North Carolina right now as well. So, all right. So, um, I think this is a little bit of a uh, kind of I'm chalkboarding with you a little bit, and it's risky to do that. I mean, most people come, they give a lecture that we've given a hundred times, but um, I've been thinking I've been thinking about this for 20 years, but especially lately about this title about the importance of functional assessment in clinical care and research. And it was really driven home to me again. Some of you know that we had a very nice publication come out in the past week or two that we'll talk a lot about, Sprint Mine. But one of the reporters did to me what people do in my neighborhood, my church, you know, my office. They'll they ask me a bunch of questions. And then there comes a pause to say, I'm done, but can I ask you about my mom? And I said, OK, sure. <laughs> you know, what can I say? Uh, so she said, you know, my mom is 90 years old, and we've really not paid that much attention to blood pressure. In fact, we've kind of passively or intentionally, not passively, intentionally neglected it. What would you do now that you have all this research in this area? And so I said, tell me about your mom. And so her mom at 90 was still playing tennis once a week. She's driving, making her all of her meals. Uh, she's shopping for herself, um, keeping house. She was more independent than I am. <laughs> and uh, and so I got to think, I said, you know, you, you need to be thinking about your mom like you think about yourself. What would you do for yourself at this age? And so that's the kind of the genesis for this talk is age is not the best uh, criteria, despite the fact that every guideline committee that I continue to work on always wants to try to use age as a criteria for what should we do for people over the age of 75 or 85. And it's an important criteria. As you learned from my friend Ann Newman, I think the last visit she was here about talking about age, um, and before that, Brett Gus Pastor, they're getting, I was going to say they're getting better and better, but then you invited me. So um, uh, the bottom line is, though, is that age is important, but I really want us to, by the end of this talk, be thinking about how to integrate cognitive and physical function into our decision making in clinical care and research. So uh, this is just an overview. Uh, I grew up in a sort of a Baptist church environment where everything had a three-point outline. So um, uh, I tried to put four or five, but my conscience bothered me so much that I couldn't do it. So I just backed it down to three. So we'll talk a little bit about, uh, you know, what's this rationale for doing what I just told you to do, uh, told you that I wanted to do. And then we'll use the sprint trial as a construct for this whole uh, conversation. Hopefully it will be a conversation by the end of this. And then I want to apply it to a couple of clinical cases that we'll weave into this presentation. This premise or prejudice, those are, this is really from some lunchtime conversations with my friend Steve Krzyzewski and I. And so we're, we're uh, talking a lot about the, the, what I've just told you, that there are, there's an aspect of health which is more than really the presence or absence of pathology. Um, and I think we all know this, but we don't think about it a lot. It's, we have a disease-based healthcare system, but as the population ages, a function-based healthcare system is much more appropriate. And so physical or cognitive function is a good measure of this aspect of health. And uh, it's valuable because it demonstrates how the patient is doing in their own individual integrated system. Uh, but I was reminded again today in my conversations, it's also a very good measure of how our integrated supposed system is helping the patient. Um, and so how the patient is traveling the galaxy of healthcare that I call it. And it's a, it's a very complicated galaxy these days. These measures can be outcomes or predictors, these functional measures. And uh, they're typically more relevant as per the phone call with this reporter than age, I think. So that's where we uh, are for now. I really need a clock. I have a, uh, I promised already some people in the audience I would be done well in advance of six o'clock. <clears throat> so, um, Oh, there's a clock. Oh, thank you. Yes, that's perfect. Yes, I knew. I, I knew, now I know why Steve is saying she's so wonderful. So, uh, okay, I want to illustrate this first of all, just quickly, with some work by uh, Heidi Kleppen. She's at Wake Forest. Heidi is 
uh, one of the few uh, geriatricians who are, who's also board certified in oncology. She's an oncologist in, uh, at Wake Forest. And so she, uh, much to my uh, discouragement to her uh, anyway, she decided to do her work based on uh, treating AML in people. And so she took here 74 individuals and looked at what are the characteristics that best predict uh, in this awful disease, how someone will respond to induction chemotherapy for AML. <clears throat> and here are the results. And I want to show you something that validates what I just said. In the red, you see age, which is not really that great a predict predictor. And the best predictors as to how someone would do after they underwent geri geriatric assessment was their cognitive and their physical function. That actually told you how well the patient would do or how not well the patient would do when they got chemotherapy. So I think we can apply this principle to a much less grave disease, but probably the most common risk factor that comes through the office of the practitioner, and that is high blood pressure. So I want to think about that in terms of uh, how should function impact our decision? Does function actually matter when you treat someone for high blood pressure? And uh, also, uh, what, what does high blood pressure do in terms of of impacting function. Ultimately, that's what people want us to do. Our patients are consumers. And most patients I know, if I just said this will make your blood pressure better and won't do anything else for you, it doesn't impact them. But if I say, this might allow you to walk down the aisle with that great grandchild in five years, then they all of a sudden sit forward and say, tell me more about it. So it, that's a functional uh, thing that I'm talking about to them. So uh, this is a patient of mine. This patient actually saw me in 2014, an 84-year-old grandmother with hypertension. She had a prior myocardial infarction. And you can see the other chronic conditions she has there. She uses a cane only for the grocery store. She's just a little bit unconfident when she's there. Uh, she, she told me she doesn't use a grocery cart because it, it, it rolls. I said, well, that's OK. Uh, <laughs> that's what they're designed to do. Uh, but she fell two months ago, but it was on ice in Winston-Salem. Um, and uh, her main goal is actually what I just talked about. It's to attend her granddaughter's wedding uh, the following summer. A ring was expected. She kept. She said, "My grandmother, my granddaughter assures me that there's a ring coming, at Valentine's." And so, we'll talk about that at the end. She's on one medicine for hypertension. Her blood pressure in the office is 138. She had a slight drop uh, on standing. Uh, no symptoms though with that drop. So, what what should I do for this patient? Then there's another patient, D.W. She's 63 year old. She's also a grandmother. She has hypertension and some other chronic conditions, but she has dementia. She's living in a nursing home and basically has a bed-to-chair existence. And the main goal, according to her family, for her at this point, was that she wanted to be as comfortable and dignified as possible. They also had a wedding coming up. This patient I'm actually just seeing recently. She's on two medicines with a blood pressure of 142. I'm just talking about the systolic blood pressure mainly today. She had about that blood pressure when we measured it in her room. And so what should I do for this patient? Those are the questions that we want to address um, when we go through this talk. So this is a very important question. Any, you've probably seen this slide already twice at least for this lecture series. Any self-respecting geriatrician or gerontologist will say how important their work is. And so this slide is really to do that as well. Just to say that yes, the people we're talking about over the age of 75 and 85, a dramatic increase in the population uh, is about to happen. So this will be a, a greater and greater more and more common scenario in your office. So I like to, when I see students and residents walking around the hall with me, uh, just talk to them about the two main reasons why we have a Pepper Center and an Alzheimer's Center, why we have a Center on Aging. It's really here. We, we're focused on preventing the two reasons why someone ends up leaving their home and going to an assisted living facility or a nursing home. And it's either leg failure or brain failure. They cannot walk confidently and they cannot remember confidently. I've seen patients with two diseases who cannot walk or think, comfort, uh, think carefully or confidently, and I have seen patients with 10 diseases. So it's not the number of diseases, so to speak, although that is also related, just like age. But it's really these two conditions, and they're often multifactorial. Many pathways lead to this condition. So for me, I was not... Uh, brilliant enough to pick an uncommon condition. So I knew pretty quickly in medical school, I needed to pick a really common condition that had a lot of power 
uh, to determine uh, any outcomes. And so hypertension is a very prevalent condition in older people. You can see here that three out of four people by the age of 75 uh, for women and 64 uh, percent, uh, two out of three men by that age. That's is actually a little bit higher now with the new guidelines, but it's a very prevalent condition. So if you can draw a relationship between treatment of hypertension and reduction of disability, you can have a major powerful effect in our society with this one. Um, <clears throat> and if you go around the world, you could ask the question, what should the blood pressure for these individuals be? And you could see any one of these, except for number five, which was when I was in medical school. It was the guideline. I still remember one of my professors saying it was 100 plus the age. That was the normal blood pressure for someone who, uh, so if you were 80, normal blood pressure was 180, um, normal systolic blood pressure. That has fallen out of favor, thank goodness, due to some uh, other work by a, a friend, a Gemini's friend at least, Bill Applegate and others for the SHEP study. But all these other numbers are actually used. Canada, it's 120. The U.S., it's 130, except if you're a family medicine doctor or an internist, their societies still recommend 140. Um, 150 is still recommended in some parts of Europe, as is 140. So all over the place, all over the map still, um, even despite what I'm about to show you. So when we're talking about hypertension, what we're trying to talk about really is we could pick any therapy. What's the effect of depression therapy or exercise or diet? But we're looking at this uh, curve, which is an idealized curve. I'll try this little pointer here. Just showing people such as us in this room who are generally functionally independent and then perhaps over time become more dependent residing in assisted living or nursing home. In this particular part of the curve, can an intervention, in this case hypertension, impact the slope of this curve so that, again, people spend, as this graph shows you, the smallest amount of time possible in a disabled state? This shouldn't be new to anyone here, but I'm just, again, setting the background so that you'll understand where we're going when we talk about the SPRINT study. Now, this is important for, I think, hypertension because even though this is an older slide, we're just redoing these numbers. Um, and still, three of the top six reasons that people become disabled in the year that they're hospitalized are complications of hypertension. So stroke, heart failure, and coronary heart disease. So if you can reduce hypertension, you can have a significant impact on reducing the pathway to disability for many people. So that's another rationale for the SPRINT trial, that, uh, at least from a geriatrician's perspective that I'm about to show you. Uh, this is just showing you the population attributable risk for the various causes, in this case for heart failure. It's a, it's a, this is a, a gender uh, initiative as well. You can see that for women, the vast majority of cases of heart failure are called by, caused by hypertension. It's really the same almost for men, but it's especially true for women. Even things like diabetes and other conditions don't cause as much heart failure as does hypertension. Also for stroke, for older people, stroke, reduction in stroke, this is a slide that just shows essentially this, that here these are various decades of age, from 50 to 59 to 80 to 89. But you can see if you drop blood pressure from 160 to 140 in this case, you can have, uh, or if you raise blood pressure, th that's the way this is really written, you can actually have a, a, a tenfold increase in stroke risk just by these 20 millimeters of mercury here, where it's only a threefold increase uh, for people 50 to 59. So this is also a very important graph to think about what can improve blood pressure care do for older people. Uh, the last sort of, I think, ep epidemiologic slide I'll show you is this very old slide, but it just shows um, what's the ideal blood pressure to have if you want the least amount of cardiovascular disease mortality. And the ideal blood pressure is somewhere around 120 over 80. But until Sprint, and ACCORD, two studies that tested this, we'd never actually tested whether treating people to this result, to this level, could actually reduce mortality in cardiovascular events. So the, 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 all the research up until 2015 
these were very large trials, but the achieved blood pressures in those trials had really re only gotten into the mid 140s. So this is why the guidelines could, said at that time, uh, we've only tested down to 140. All these studies were, had a highly positive effect. Um, but the, the recommendations could only say, we only know for sure that getting people into the 140s systolic is uh, safe. Uh, but we know that getting them there is safe and effective. But we had not actually tested getting people down to 120. By the way, just to get to 140, people had to have, on average, these are listing many, many of these studies, at least two medications, sometimes three, to get to uh, that 140. So this is not also a trivial medication burden for people. Um, having to take an additional medication a day makes you more susceptible to complications of those medications. So we want to do our recommendations based on evidence, evidence so, that, so that I and many of you can sit in front of a patient and say, what's the risk benefit of achieving this goal? With me so far? Based on that, this was the blood pressure recommendations from the Joint National Commission number eight. These are now gone. But this is why that group said, if your age is greater than 60, then the goal blood pressure should be less than 150. Uh, interestingly, they said if the age is less than 60, your goal blood pressure should be less than 140. Although, in this set of trials, almost all the events came from older people over the age of 60. <laughs> so uh, there was some lack of consistency here. But they're my friends, and I won't talk about it anymore. So. Um, uh, the, uh, th then there was uh, some recommendations for people with diabetes and then uh, chronic kidney disease. But the bottom line I want to show you for now, for our purposes, is this is why uh, 10 years ago, the blood pressure, or less than 10 years ago, the blood pressure recommendation for people over the age of 60 was less than 150. Now, all this to say we've come a long way. This is the Los Angeles Times, the day after President Roosevelt passed away. And actually, here's the physician evaluation of him two months before he died. His blood pressure was 260 over 150. And he was given digitalis and phenobarbital. That was all that they, they had to give him that day. And uh, not surprisingly, he had a massive stroke uh, just a few weeks after this. So I think we should always pause and say we live in a wonderful time. I mean, th this is no longer the standard of care uh, and usually the presidents of the United States get standard of care. I'm, I'm chuckling for several reasons, but we'll just move on. Yeah. So um, anyway, um, so that's the background that we will come back to when I talk about um, integrating function into a large clinical trial like SPRINT. So what do we know? Observational studies have identified a strong association between uh, blood pressure and the risk of cardiovascular disease above the level of 120. This is actually the same for Alzheimer's disease, by the way. The higher you go above 120, the more likely a person is to get Alzheimer's disease defined broadly. High blood pressure is very common. It's a prevalent condition. Um, it's the leading risk factor for mortality and disability adjusted, uh, uh, life adjusted years. Very prevalent across the world. Um, uh, I was just talking to, I think, uh, one, one of your colleagues today about um, how in other countries that are just right south of here, blood pressure control is very poor. So we, we can have a large impact beyond the borders of this nation by doing work on inexpensive therapies for this. Clinical trials have demonstrated effectiveness in this area. And so all this is uncertain. And we really don't know what's the impact of and the impact on physical and cognitive function for blood pressure lowering. So in that context, uh, we began designing the SPRINT trial uh, in 2001. So it takes a long time to do a big trial like this. And we went to the field, as I'll show you several slides from now, in 2010, and rec we recruited our first participant at that time. But the basic design was to randomize 10,000 people, let's say, to an intensive blood pressure goal, get there however you can, with however, however many medications it takes, of 120 versus a goal of 140. And the hypothesis was that this group would have less cardiovascular events and death in this group than this group. 
Um, and then we added on some things that I'll show you in a moment um, once the geriatrician sh showed up. These were the inclusion criteria. Anyone over the age of 50, there was no upper limit. Sprint had about 1,000 people over the age of 80 in the study. <clears throat> uh, here are the blood pressure ranges. And you had to have at least one of these four, uh, either clinical or subclinical CVD, chronic kidney disease, um, or a Framingham risk score greater than 15%. Anyone over the age of 75 actually qualifies based on this um, definition right here. So that was the entry criteria. And we excluded some people, those who had had a previous stroke because, and those who had diabetes because there were two trials going on testing blood pressure levels. And we didn't want the results of those trials to then un confuse our participants as to what to do, <laughs> or our investigators for that matter. So, uh, and then we, anybody who had, Clinically apparent class two, class three or four, I'm sorry, uh, heart failure uh, was not eligible because they often need the medications that we're going to use to, to treat blood pressure. Otherwise, we excluded only dementia and if you lived in a nursing home. Um, we also ended up excluding most people who lived in an assisted living facility. So there's the exclusion criteria. There were no other chronic conditions that were specifically excluded um, from this trial. We then added, uh, because of some additional funding back in the days of the ARA funding, ARRA, the Recovery and Reinvestment Act, we added some special things from our PEPPER centers, this one here and others. We added, how can we can a measure of gate speed, a four meter gate speed at all 100 sites? And we trained the staff using PEPPER center staff to do it. We uh, also added a measure of frailty using a, a marker that I'll talk about perhaps a little later. And then also we added uh, adjudicated incidents of MCI, mild cognitive impairment, and dementia. And I'll talk about these a little bit later. And then we added some other things. We were, myself included, we're almost certain that more people would fall in the intensive group than in the standard group. So we'll see how that happens. We added depression score, a, an assessment of orthostatic hypotension in the office that was standardized, hospitalizations, and nursing home placement. This is the primary outcome. One thing I've also learned from cardiovascular disease researchers, having kind of grown up in their camp, is that they're really smart. They don't just pick one thing. They pick a whole bunch of things to make their primary outcome. And that's a good way to increase your power and to make sure that your result is, is uh, as confidently stated as possible. So these were all, any one of these made you eligible for the primary outcome. And then here was the primary hypothesis that you can, I've already stated. Now we had some other outcomes and I'm just thinking that uh, we, we, we've already talked about these and for the sake of time I'm going to go ahead and skip through them. The study was nationwide from Washington State to Puerto Rico. So uh, in a minute you'll see that we had a very diverse representation. Um, Houston is also in the study, but I, maybe that's Galveston. It just couldn't get on the map. So, um, uh, so the BP intervention was this. For the first three months, uh, participants came into the office and had their blood pressure measured, and if they weren't at their assigned goal, uh, then they had their medications adjusted. Some were adjusted up, some were adjusted down. And then they were seen then every three months, so four times a year, uh, at which time their blood pressure could be uh, blood pressure medication regimen could be adjusted again. Agents from all the major antihypertensive drug classes were available and provided to the participants at no charge. Um, there was a periodic assessment standardized for orthostatic hypotension that I've already told you about. And uh, we gave those people over the age of 75 uh, a chance to start slow and go slow. So we started them with one medication rather than um, two. And uh, if the blood pressure was uh, below 135 in the standard group, then we would titrate them up a little bit. And about 10% of the participants, that happened. This is what I mentioned to you earlier. First of all, uh, I think this is a triumph of clinical trial achievement uh, in that almost 30% of the people in this trial were over the age of 75. And 30% of the individuals were African American and 10% and of the individuals, almost 11%, were Hispanic. So this is a, a very representative sample of people. And it was important to all the clinicians that we'd be able to say when someone sits in front of us in the office, 
someone like you was likely in the study. And so uh, I think we need to move more and more in that direction for our clinical trials. It's, oops, sorry about that. It's also important to note here that we weren't lowering these people from 160 to 120. Here were the mean baseline blood pressures, and there were 140 in both groups, in, in both groups here. So you can see that um, uh, one group uh, was lower to 120, and the other group I'll show you in just a moment on average went to about 135. Here are the blood pressure curves I just mentioned to you. Pretty quickly, when you give people their medications at no cost, they get to their goal pretty quickly. And so the group on the bottom ended up with an average blood pressure of 121.5. And the standard group ended up with an average blood pressure of about 135. This, to achieve this difference, required one additional medication per day. Two for the st standard group, three for the intensive group. Now, uh, almost four years ago now, the uh, Data Safety and Monitoring Board had, was completely convinced that the intensive group was having significantly lower deaths and primary events. And so they recommended that the study staff and patients be unblinded, and they were unblinded based on the recommendation from the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, and the decision was made to stop the blood pressure intervention. I could say more about that, but I won't. Um, and so we continued, though, to follow people for cognitive outcomes and for renal outcomes uh, based on some things that I'll show you in a moment. This is the primary that's already been published uh, back in 2015, just showing that for the primary outcome, the red or intensive group had much less death and heart disease than did significantly less, 25% less uh, than did the uh, standard group. And then you can see death from any cause also was lower in this group. Rarely. I've said this to a couple people today, rarely do you have a clinical trial where the primary outcome is better and also people die less. Usually it's where the primary outcome is, is nothing. <laughs> well, I've had plenty of those. And, uh, but usually it's where the primary outcome might be better, but you still didn't change the death rate in overall. So this will be one of the few trials in our lifetime, certainly mine, that will ever see this kind of result. But that doesn't really answer the question about the two patients that I told you. What what about them? Were people like them really in Sprint? And you have some idea about this already. Uh, there's a quotation mark that I've left out of this here. Isn't, I, I had many of my colleagues say, isn't it dangerous to lower people's blood pressure? Um, and is intensive blood pressure different? Is the response different if someone is frail? Um, and did it address what is most important to older people? Um, most of my patients say, well, the worst thing that could happen to me is if you give me a healthy heart, but give me a, harm, a, a dead brain. And so um, that's a really important outcome for people. Most of my patients would say, I'd much rather die and die w with my brain and memory intact than not have memory for the last five years of my life. And so we really didn't know the answer at this point to this question. And there was some conflicting data about this. Here I just listed five studies which showed all over the map that Blood pressure treatment um, is associated with falling more, not falling more. Um, and so it was really not clear what the answer was. Um, this we can answer, uh, which I'll show you in just a moment, uh, in the current uh, analysis, the, the, just the blood pressure data with the cardiovascular. But we wanted to put those things in uh, a senior, a sprint senior context. And so I've already gone over most of this, and I won't do it again for now. But it's very important to do this uh, because uh, one of the major criticisms always of a clinical trial like this is, well, this had only healthy people. Um, and so this doesn't apply to the patients who are sitting in front of me. And to some extent, that's always true. I was talking to one of the fellows today about a study looking at, um, that's my water. It's not open, though. Oh, it is open. Uh, make sure that's on the TV camera so for my wife. <laughs> so um, so um, I was talking to someone one day about they were looking at peripheral neuropathy, and we were talking about the concept of generalizability. And I said, well, you don't want to just generalize that to all the patients in the population. You want to generalize your study to people who have peripheral neuropathy. And so we designed Sprint to be generalized to people who were not in a nursing home, not in an assisted living facility, who were ambulatory, who were generally able to come to their physician's office. 
<clears throat> and so it's important to say, though, in that group, did we have a representative spectrum of people? Um, there's concerns always about selection bias in a clinical trial like this. One of my favorite friends, uh, John Muller, is always criticizing some of us about this very topic. So um, concerns that uh, trial cohorts are healthier are common in this regard. So what were the results? Well, first of all, it was important to show that uh, this was not a pristinely healthy group. These were all the people over the age of 75. And I think, uh, just to save time, let's just look at the geriatric, oh, oh I knew I was going to do that once. Um, let's look at the geriatric uh, markers here. First of all, gait speed. One third of the people over the age of 75 had a gait speed of less than 0.8 meters per second. And one third of the individuals were frail. And these also weren't cognitively pristine people either. Their mean MOCA score was 22. So uh, we had some idea that these individuals were, not, were, were somewhat representative of the ambulatory population who would come to a provider's office. Also, it's interesting to note that in the frail people, uh, we were not quite able to get them down to the 121 that we were able to get the fit people to. So frail people had a little bit more difficulty achieving the blood pressure goal. Some people took this as a negative, but I took it as validation. We had some frail people that were difficult to control and that the clinicians were saying, I'm not sure I want to push this anymore on this person. So that, and the, the, the diastolic pressures were no different really uh, by class of, of uh, frailty. They're lower in the, in the intensive group than in the standard group. Hopefully that um, gives you a little bit of context to this. So what did we find? Uh, it, we found that for people, just when we take age as a cut point, which isn't my favorite cut point, I've already told you, you can see that for the primary outcome, people who were over the age of 75 had a much better uh, outcome than did people who were on the standard group, those in the intensive group. The same for all-cause mortality. People had much lower death rate in the, in the intensive group than the standard group. You only needed to treat 41 people to prevent one death for three and a half years. Um, you needed to prevent only 28 people to prevent one of those other outcomes or death, which I showed you, commonly lead to disability in older people. We also looked at gait speed. Well, does gait speed make a difference? And here's where we start to enter the thesis of this talk. Is physical function different in terms of its, does it make a different response in terms of treating blood pressure? And so you see here again <coughs> that uh, people with a slow gait speed who are in the intensive group benefited more than those with a slow gait speed in the standard group. Uh, and these were people, in fact, you could say in some ways that the benefit, because they die more, they have more events than the people with the high gait speed. This is what you would expect if you're looking at gait speed. These people are way more healthy, far more healthy than these individuals. We also used that Rockwood frailty score, which I don't have time to go into, but just to divide the population into fit, frail, and then an intermediate group. And you can see here that frail people whose blood pressure was controlled um, more intensively in the intensive group also did better with the primary outcome uh, than did those in the standard group. And it didn't matter whether you're in the less fit or the fit group. This is a funky looking curve here because fit older people don't have many events. Uh, and so again, I'm showing you the hypothesis that is talking, that is generated in our conversation that it's not about your age, it's about your level of fitness that really should guide your care. Also, falls were no different in either group. Um, slightly less, but not far from statistical, very far from statistical significance. All the serious adverse events that could be totaled up were no different. However, there was more acute kidney injury or acute kidney failure in the intensive group. So it's not all uh, coming up roses here. What does this mean? Many of the patients in the intensive group were on diuretic therapy, and so they were more likely to become dehydrated and have acute kidney injury uh, if they got a viral illness or something like that. And so uh, this is something that we always have to talk to patients about, and I talk to my patients about it. So you have a chance of getting more acute kidney injury, more dehydration. 
Uh, by the way, there's no increase in end-stage renal disease in either group. None of, no, only two patients went on dialysis, one in each group during the whole study. So, uh, but most patients say, well, I'll take my chances with getting dehydrated if you can tell me I'll have less heart failure, death, stroke, etc. But some say, no, I don't want to take that chance. So that's the conversation we have. Uh, there was no more orthostatic hypotension in these groups when they were measured in the office. Um, so that's another thing to consider. There was no more withdrawal of consent or loss to follow up in the intensive group or being followed but saying, I don't want to take the medications anymore. It was the same for both groups. Even when we looked at frailty status, as you would expect, there are more frail people who entered these categories than fit people. Very few fit people uh, decided not to do any of these. But they were no different by the intensive or the standard group. All right, so we're going to end here with uh, results that were published uh, this last week in JAMA about what's the effect of this on the brain. And so just a quick run through about why we thought this was reasonably to be tested. Um, here are all the, all the trials listed that were a blood pressure lowering that had some sort of cognitive function measure. Most of them used one measure, the, like the mini mental status exam, which we all know is... I liken the mini metal studies exam to having an echocardiogram that only detects blood, uh, uh, poor ejection fraction below 10%. So it's not a great tool for detecting early change. And it's very biased and culturally biased. It has many problems. Uh, and almost all of the people in these studies were not neuro neuropsychologists, geriatricians, neurologists. They were really well-meaning uh, cardiovascular researchers who said, let's throw one of these in here and see what happens. So uh, of these trials, only four had even thought about dementia, and none of the trials really followed anyone more than three years. So there really was not a robust assessment of whether people develop cognitive impairment or not. Um, <clears throat> so in that context, we also made a sort of a co-primary hypothesis that all cause probable dementia, mild cognitive impairment, or the composite outcome of both of these two I was beginning to learn from my cardiovascular colleagues would be different, lower in the uh, intensive group. Now this is a reminder of where all this was happening. As I mentioned to you, we randomized the first whoop, the first participant in 2010, late 2010, and the last participant in early 2013. Then in 2015, and so the year two visits had all happened, and in 2015, here was the decision to stop the intervention at, at an average follow-up of 3.3 three years. That was right in the middle of our year four visit window. And so we had to compress all that and do a closeout visit during the fall of 2015 and the winter of 2016. And then the NIA stepped in and said, let's do one more assessment of the cognition, and we'll fund that. Um, and so we finished just this past July uh, last year of all of our cognitive assessments for dementia and uh, mild cognitive impairment. We took all that information uh, as well as the depression information, information on any medications they might be using, as well as what's called the FAQ. Uh, and we that was a 10-item questionnaire to the caregiver to say, how's this person doing in things like playing a game, managing their finances, remembering appointments, Remembering your birthday, that kind of thing. I'm glad they didn't ask me some of that. But um, Here's what happened to the blood pressures after the study was, the intervention was stopped and people were returned to primary care. So uh, we, I showed you this wonderful, beautiful curve uh, here. But we found that by the time we were doing the closeout visits and people were no longer getting their medications from the research study, the blood pressure had risen to 125. And then when we did the follow-up visits that just ended this past year, the blood pressure in the intensive group was at 129. The blood pressure never really changed that much in the standard group. Um, so uh, that's where the blood pressure curves were as we're doing all this. Um, one other thing before I show the results, and this is about what is mild cognitive impairment. And I think I've already talked about this, but it's really the earliest form of uh, dementia. It's a transitional state. People with mild cognitive impairment have trouble living in a complex and increasingly complex world. 
uh, playing a game with their family, managing their finances, um, uh, preparing a, a complex meal, for example. They're more likely to microwave food, et cetera, et cetera. So, but in general, they can function fairly well on a daily basis. It's an unstable state. About 25 to 30, maybe 40% of people revert to no impairment over a year, but those people have a much higher chance of developing dementia over five years. And it also, uh, by the way, has an ICD-9 code. It, has a, it, it is a clinical diagnosis now. So in Sprint, uh, we, uh, I won't go through all of this, but in Sprint, we said you had to have two MCI diagnoses adjudicated in a row in order to achieve that endpoint. We didn't want to just take one because we felt like that would be too unstable. Um, and here's a picture of what that looked like. So you had to have MCI or MCI and probable dementia or MCI and MCI are probable dementia like that. Um, not any of these others. You couldn't have one um, case of MCI and that be called uh, a case. Uh, here's our battery. We had a screening battery that, that was in the bold texted instruments, the digit symbol coding, logical memory, and the MOCA. That took about 15 minutes for us to do. 20 minutes, I would say. I would say 15 and all the staff would say 20. So. Um, and the, then if they scored below certain cutoffs that we adjusted after the first year for age, education, race, and ethnicity, we used our own cohort to make those adjustments. That was somewhat criticized, but it was the best you could do using this instrument at the time. And then we, if they triggered below that, then we added a 30-minute battery that duplicated all the domains that were represented in the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. Um, and then we used all that. Uh, we had 12 experts, geriatricians, neurologists, neuropsychologists, who would review the case. They were assigned a case, and if two people agreed, the case was decided. But if they disagreed, they had to present their arguments before the whole group, and the group voted. There were 13, not 12. That way there was an odd number. Uh, here is our result. So this was published last week to show that, yes, there was a lower uh, rate of new cases of dementia in the intensive group versus the standard group but it only achieved a p-value of 0.10. So there was a 17% reduction, you can see right here, with a p-value of 0.10. So we can't say that we prevented dementia by intensive blood pressure control. However, we can say, we could actually say this at the 3.3 at the year, uh, year mark, that we had a 19% a reduction in MCI. So that's the first time in history that's ever been shown. So that the uh, intensive group had a significantly lower development of the transitional state of mild or early cognitive impairment in this group. Uh, this is an unusual graph because remember I told you, you had two consecutive uh, in a row so anybody that had one in, in here, the first one, they weren't counted. The first uh, occurrence. This is just a table from uh, the JAMA. We also combined the composite outcome, which was also significant at 0.01, um, and showed um, a 15% uh, reduction. So uh, the key message here is that all of these were in the same direction. Um, and so dementia was close, and MCI was, was positive, and so was the combined outcome. So this was the impetus for others contacting us and saying, will you do another assessment? Rarely do you have an institute calling you and saying, will you do an additional assessment? We'll pay the cost of that. Well, this is one of those times where they actually said, if you'll do one more assessment, maybe you can be clear on that answer. That's not guaranteed, but I think it will likely happen. So what's our conclusion? Sprint demonstrated that physical and cognitive outcomes important to older people can be integrated into large randomized controlled trials. And uh, I just really need to publicly, again, thank the staff at all these 100 sites. They did a beautiful job of measuring gait speed. Um, the only problem we ever had was one site was using uh, three meters rather than four meters for some reason. We couldn't figure out why. So all their numbers kept coming in wrong, and so we had to send them a, a different measuring stick. <laughs> uh, so uh, I won't say where that site was, but it wasn't in Texas. I can tell you that. Uh, so we, we had to adjust their results. But other than that, uh, everybody did a wonderful job. And uh, the benefits of bl blood pressure lowering impacted health events, which really are important on the pathway to disability. Few people realize 
A diagnosis of congestive heart failure is more deadly than a diagnosis of cancer in someone who's 70 years old. It's, it's, it's more likely that person will be disabled or dead in a shorter period of time if they're diagnosed with heart failure rather than cancer. So it's a serious disease. Um, the direction and significance of the adverse events were the same, whether you were older or younger. I didn't really show you that data, but the likelihood of becoming dehydrated was the same whether you were 60 or 80. It didn't matter, or I should say 75 and older or 75 and younger. Um, so a sprint doesn't tell us, though, about treatment goals for people who live in nursing homes or assisted living, people who have heart failure or diabetes or prior stroke. Um, so we can say for the first time we have something in history that can reduce the chance of developing early dementia. We've never been able in a randomized clinical trial to show that before. There's no evidence that lowering blood pressure harms your brain. And uh, it also demonstrated, I think very importantly, that a diverse population of people can be recruited and tested uh, for cognitive endpoints and functional endpoints. We had an amazing participation by this group. 92% of the people had more than one follow-up visit and they had almost all the battery done. So this is a tremendous testament to the volunteerism of the people who live in our communities. I'm, I'm never, uh, I'm just amazed at that. Not never amazed, I'm always amazed. What about my two patients? Well, this lady, uh, I told you I saw her back in 2014. She had a stroke actually over the Christmas holidays in 2015. If I had known the sprint results, I would have actually changed her blood pressure medicine, but I didn't. I just said, look, this is the best guideline we have right now. And I don't know if it would have presented, prevented that stroke, but I probably would have been more aggressive in her care. Uh, this lady's family said, Dr. Williamson, I, I can see there is no uh, guideline, and we think our mom is on too much medicine. Is it okay if we taper one medicine off? I said, yeah, let's do it. That's fine. Not a problem at all. And see how she does. She's in hospice care now. She's very comfortable. She's having her wishes fulfilled. So again, these two cases illustrate this lady is younger than this lady, but their care is being based on their function um, and not on their age. Uh, this is just the incredible number of people who participated in this, a thanks to them again. This, probably, this study had half the geriatricians in the United States were, were on the study, I thought, not really, but um, there were a lot of geriatricians who informed this design, and so I'm really speaking on their behalf. My colleague, Dave Grabusen, who's in the coordinating center and this, 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 the statistician for a lot of these results, I'm, I'm just sort of a talking head for them. Uh, but um, uh, a lot of really important people uh, who've mentored me through the years, uh, these institutes all work together. Uh, and uh, I thought they worked together beautifully to uh, help us get this result. The Data Safety and Monitoring Board, they were geriatricians by the end of the study. Um, and as I said, uh, only 5% of the medications were supplied uh, by a drug company. Thank you very much. So now we have time for a few questions for Dr. Williamson. Thank you very much for the very nice talk. Question. Which of the blood pressure medications was the most this is the most common question I get, which is good. It's great to start off with this question. So because Sprint was a, a strategy study, it was looking at getting to the target, we really can't say which medications were most effective. The frontline providers could choose anything on the shelf in that room to do it. We do have uh, some hints that in post hoc analysis, we call it, that some of the medications were more effective in preventing dementia than others. Prevent, not dementia, but MCI. And so we've asked for additional funding to more intensively analyze the data, but we don't really know the question. And even that won't formally answer it. But um, uh, all we can say now is that this goal is better than that goal. Does that make sense? Can you describe like just the, uh, the overall use of the different beds? Like 80% yeah. of people got that? Yeah. The most common medication used in, the, in, in either group uh, was a, a, a thiazide diuretic. And we use chlorthalidone. We don't use, that means my time is up. I'm sorry, I can't answer that question. Uh, 
we use chlorthalidone, and, and so that's the most common medicine that was used, a thiazide diuretic. Uh, we don't use HCTZ often. Um, why, do you, why do you think physicians use HCTZ more than chlorthalidone? All the studies use chlorthalidone. chlorthalidone. That's exactly right. And we all use HCTZ. Yeah. HCTZ actually has a shorter half-life than chlorthalidone. Uh, so most people use it because HCTZ is easy to write. To be honest with you, every time I've asked that to a clinician, they say, I don't want to write out chlorthalidone. Um, so I personally think that, I'll just tell you, I, it's not, this is a generic medicine. I use chlorthalidone in my, my practice for all of my patients unless they have some problem with it I've never had. So uh, HCTZ is a fine drug, but I, I really think that chlorthalidone is a better, more well-tested drug. It's the one used, as Jim said. So the, other, the next co most common was either an ACE or an ARB. Uh, and they were about the same. After that was a calcium channel blocker. Those were all fairly close. Uh, then after that, a beta blocker. Beta blockers are not good. If you don't have cardiovascular disease indication, they're not a good first choice. Um, let's see, I was, who was I talking to today? Dr. I can't remember. Anyway, I, I was talking to someone today about the fact that I go to Central America quite a bit and they use a tenolol to control blood pressure, which is a terrible medication for blood pressure. It, it really has a half-life that's less than three or four hours. Um, if I'm upsetting you because you're on a tenolol right now, I'm sorry, but go get it changed. If you're on a beta blocker to control your blood pressure, a tenolol is just not a good drug for that. So um, that's, that's sort of the distribution. Yes? In terms of symptoms that people refer to in intense therapy, uh, what's your take on that? Because a lot of patients say, yeah, it's great, it's 120, yeah. but I feel tired, I can't get out of bed, I, <coughs> uh, which is not related to any of the heart outcomes, but it's a concern for sure. adherence to treatment. That's a great question. A couple of answers. Number one, uh, I think I've mentioned this, but the quality of life paper was published, which answered, asked a lot of all those questions, <coughs> was published in the New England Journal, and we found no difference in the quality of life scores between the two groups. I think, uh, <coughs> First of all, we tend to note people who feel more fatigued when they're in their 120s, but we found that the reporting of it was no different. Then the other thing, though, I want to make sure is that the 121.5 is a bell curve. Some people in the intensive group could never get below 130. Some people got down to 115. If you're at 115, you feel great, go for it. But uh, so, and I have some of my own patients. I have one patient who I've taken care of for years, and they just say, I feel awful if I'm below 130. Can I, can I just get to 135? I say, sure, because they started at 160. That's great. So again, a clinical trial is only a place to start the discussion with a patient. It's not the gold golden rule due unto others. It's, it's where you should start the discussion, and then you do your best to try to get there. And I'm, I'm amazed at how many of my patients actually get there. They say, you know, I feel really well. I don't feel any different. So we often abandon it before we try it. Yes? Do you find any link between the reduction in blood pressure and driving? No one has looked yet. You can do that ancillary study for us if you'd like. Ancillary. <laughs> yeah. Do you know how many comorbidities this group of the patients has? So I'm looking at the patients who really have more like isolated hypertension. Uh -huh. Even they are kind of more mobility issues, for example, or other issues, versus those patients who already have, you know, the 10 list of, mm -hmm. of uh, diseases which you also have to give them other medications. Mm -hmm. The comorbidities uh, were about were exactly the same in both groups, and I, I don't I can't remember the number. Uh, it may be, I don't think it's on the slide that I have there, but people had a, about four or five chronic diseases in both groups, on average. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. UTMB Health, working together to work wonders. <laughs>